Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tom Tiberio, and on behalf of the program in creative writing, thank you all for being here for the second night of our Spring Literary Festival. As a friendly reminder, if you would take a moment now to silence any cell phones, we appreciate it. Tonight, we will hear from two esteemed writers, the poet Kevin Prufer and fiction writer Kelly Link. And Mr. Prufer actually is an Ohio native, so as Dave Wanzik would say, we will claim him, as with our other visiting writers, as honorary Bobcats. And here, uh, to give a proper introduction to Mr. Prufer, our own Professor Jill Rosser. Thanks for being here. I'm excited to be here for our second evening of literary festival activities. I'm really excited to introduce Kevin Prufer, but I just would like to say this is such a great lineup of writers. I, some of my favorite writers here coming all the way to Athens, Ohio. Yeah, this is the hub. This is where it's all happening. I would like you to please take some time to read the list of Kevin Prufer's many publications and awards and other accomplishments in this wonderfully informative tabloid that's available out there because I want to talk about other stuff. I want to describe the uncanny sense of timelessness one gets when reading Kevin Prufer's work. The often fabulistic or parabolic scenes and events he narrates could have occurred thousands of years ago, or yesterday, or a hundred years in the future. In one poem, a giant bird the size of a mountain becomes a man's home or village. In another, the suburbs have been sealed by a gigantic parachute, and the speaker is wandering around its circumference trying to find a way out. In another, we follow the thoughts of an empathetic and devoutly religious bomb before it goes off and at actual detonation time. In another, greedy corporations buy up pieces of the moon and install cannons on it, right? Why not? That's why you would want the moon, right? Proofers a uh, stable of sometimes half-dreaming, uh, sometimes stunned speakers uh, often sound more numbed than shocked, more curious than appalled, more puzzled than panicked by their circumstances. When I read Kevin Proofer's poems, I'm reminded of Cormac McCarthy's novel, The Road, in which all the standing trees are dead uh, but and about to fall, and the sight and sound of them falling permeates the entire novel. And so those still standing trees are emblems of the natural order, which is utterly destroyed. Yet somehow the presence of upright trees allows people to superficially deny that their lives and their world are doomed. These emblems of their destroyed world are also used as fuel and help them to survive. Similarly, the personae in Prufer's visionary world suspect their values have been thwarted, perverted, and dismissed by the very culture that provides them with necessities for survival. There's a kind of controlled desperation here. His disoriented speakers witness what has happened, some atrocity or devastation or betrayal, and they continually endeavor to find something that will reconstitute the dissolved value system with an expression of yearning, or they fight their isolation by attempting some form of communication, however futile, by questioning the events, by doubting what they see. The poems resonate deeply as acutely expressive of our daily American human coping mechanisms, our discomfort with our comfort. I know this sounds like these poems are all rather bleak, but they're not. I, I, somehow they're not. Um, there's humor. Um, there's gorgeous imagery and the kind of storytelling that makes the hearer feel excited to be alive in this moment. I think that there is no other poet writing today 
who so profoundly captures our state of repressed horror as we sit with our glass of wine and watch the news igniting our worst nightmares in the living room. Global warming, mass shootings, other acts of terrorism, mind-shattering injustice and cruelty. How do we process these things and go on as if anything we love could be nurtured, shielded, preserved? How can we even go on believing that we believe in our beliefs? I'm not sure these poems can answer that question, but they make us think very hard about it. And I'm pretty sure that is the only thing, hard thinking, that can save us. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Prufer. Thank you for that really kind introduction and um, for having me here too. It's, it's been just a delight of listening to readings and, and talks and, and overhearing good conversation. Um, I promised a few uh, graduate students today that I would begin by reading a poem not by me but by the Ohio-based poet Russell Atkins who um, is a Cleveland poet who's still alive. He's in a nursing home up in Cleveland. Uh, an odd, an odd, utterly, I think, unknown writer who um, was the only African American editor of an experimental poetics magazine. That sounds like trivia, but it's not. It's, it's. I think it's um, important. And um, uh, a poet who sort of refused to participate in the Black Arts Movement, but. Um, but sort of found his own odd idiom. I don't know if that's gonna work, let's see. How's that? No? Maybe I'll just stoop. <laughs> Does anybody know how to work on these things? Oh, I have an idea. <laughs> I think I'm going to read really loud. How's that? Thank you. <laughs> An umbrella. I'll begin with Russell Atkins, who would have thought that was pretty funny. Um, this is a song about Lake Erie. It's called Lakefront Cleveland. So thunders see, it gathers strength, summoned, ascends, huged up, then softs, curls up about rock, up curls about thick, about bold, curls up about it, then dangerous, soft. Sea gathers strength, summoned, ascends, up huged over whatever's round, crashes, curls up about rock, up curls about at, bold, abruptly, curls about it, Softs, dangerous, so oft, too soft, almost summoned, ascends up huge, crashes, curls up about rock, soft, furious, but soft, too soft, whist, almost, womb, whamming, everywhere it gathers strength, summoned, ascends, huge, up, splash, about, of bold, up curls about rock, rocks about impetuous, curls, curls up about softs, dangerously. Too soft with a shudder. And I think what I'm going to do with my poems is I'm going to read, um, I'm going to cut, try to move back and forth between shorter sort of lyric poems and longer poems that tell stories. And we'll see how that goes. This one begins with a line from Auden. In the flu-infected city, the children sleep, while overhead the lead-inflected sky begins to weep. Child, 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 their mothers say, cold cloths to their heads. The lamps beside them cast their glares from night tables to beds. Disease, like a light switch, voids the city. The children sleep or die. 
The sleeping dream of dying, and the dead ones sleep awry. Jill um, alluded to this poem about a giant parachute. Um, I, I imagined it fell over St. Louis, the city of St. Louis, but that's not really in the poem. Um, but it is a sort of a love poem um, about how everyone got out from under the parachute in time except this one guy, and he's trapped underneath it. The enormous parachute. The parachute fell over the suburb, draping the houses with nylon and rope. And where were you? Far away and half asleep. A letter. Dear X, the nylon is so lovely on a warm fall night when the breezes fill it and the porch lights glow. It takes on that gentle blush of your cheek and I want to rise and touch it or wrap myself in it. The birds make scratching sounds where the cord has caught their legs. Otherwise, it's very quiet here and I miss the stars and you. Love, K. On the third night, I walked home from my, I walked from my house to find that place where the nylon ended. I followed a single cord stretched down the street and over a rooftop. In some regions, the parachute draped so low I had to duck or hold the nylon up with my fingertips. Elsewhere, it wagged high above me, suspended from gables or treetops. Always, I thought of you asleep on the sofa in your robe, the TV on, the quiet house beyond the parachute. I camped beside an empty swimming pool and watched the parachute shimmer over the street lamps. Days the sun filled it, spreading the light evenly over the neighborhood. In time, I became accustomed to that, the parachute glowing pink each morning, then white hot by afternoon. Dear X, remember how I first kissed you in the parking lot, the hush that fell over us when at last I released you? The parachute is like that, but lasts longer. A dog approached me warily today, growled, then when I held out my hand, he licked it. He accompanies me now. We eat scraps from the refrigerators of those who fled in time, and we sleep sometimes in their beds, love. Frost came early, then sleep, drumming its fingers on the fabric. Where the parachute tore, icicles formed, hanging dangerously over the streets. Some were enormous and lovely, cascading along the parachute's gullies and runnels, others more delicate, hundreds lining the seams. When the temperature rose the next morning, I heard them crash into the streets. Early winter light from holes torn in the fabric, like long fingers. I followed the cord, but could not find the end. Dear X, sometimes I despair of ever discovering the parachute's edge or returning to you. It sags and heaves in the wind. When there's rain, I drink from the runoff that spouts from the holes. Were you here, I showed, I'd show you that place where I climbed through a hole and saw the parachute stretched for miles, dune-like, snow-like, tenting over the trees and houses, so beautiful I know you'd agree, and terrible. Migrating birds, unable to find sustenance or a branch to rest on, die over the parachute. At night I dream of you, sunlight, sometimes the shore. Yours, K. And then one winter day, I found not the edge of the parachute, but that place where the cords came together at its center, the length I'd followed lifting suddenly into the air where it tangled in the high trees with a starburst of others. The dog panted beside me, then barked, and far above our heads, suspended from a harness, a dead man swung. Dear X, we buried the man at that point below the center of the parachute and made of his rucksack a crude memorial. I did not have any books, so recited a bit from a hymnal I found moldering on a church floor. Then, unsatisfied, I read to him from this account. You have no doubt moved on by now. For my part, I will rest here in the shadow of the parachute and the steeple's shadow until spring.
This one's called Love Poem. I'll make you a bomb. First the booster gas canister, then the heat shield, then the radium case, which, yes, is shaped like a peanut. I'll make you a bomb. First the heat field, then the lenses that drive the implosion, and last the radiation space, which, yes, is shaped like a peanut. I'll make you a bomb. First the space filler, then the glass lenses, which, careful, may implode. I'll make you a swan. First a crease here, then a crease there, a quick tuck for the wings, an explosion of flight. I'll make you a swan, one, two, three folds, and now it's done, but it will not fly. Its wingtips burning like fuses. I'll make you a dress, don't you love me? A nip and a tuck and three pins to hold it tight. I'll make you a little white dress. Inside it, your heart says bang, 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 your mind like a swan's. Careful, it's shaped like a peanut. Careful of when it decays. Careful, it may implode. Don't you love me? Look what I've made you. I have to flip back and forth because I'm trying to hold to this long poem, short poem thing. This is another one Jill alluded to in her really um, kind uh, introduction. This is the one where the corporations buy the moon and put the cannons on it. It's called The Moon is Burning. Well, actually, it's not really that one. That, that one's more of another one. You know what? Scratch that. The moon is burning. <laughs> Such snow, I said. Then, no, smearing a bit of soot between my fingers. Not snow. The moon crackled and glowed above the trees. A single plume of flame like a petal unfurled from a crater and disappeared. In the night sky, orange moon, moon, and the sparks that fell like cigarettes or tiny empires to the ground, ash in the hair and the throat, so I ducked beneath the trees and wiped soot from my eyes. My barn glowed on the hill, and the moon spun in its orbit, coughing smoke and flame. I have often looked across the fields, and the moon said, you have only a short time, your kind. I paid it no mind. Everything is always talking. Dark moon, crescent, half, a fire. Moon that skimmed the distant mountains beyond which the capital slept. Moon that reddened them and cast the city, I guessed, in a lovely glow. I offer these to the Republic. My ashy coat, the moon ruined. My shoes, which after a time were thick with soot. A horse. They wouldn't do, and soon the houses came awake and spilled their lights over the blanketed landscape. My neighbors shielded their eyes to watch the moon that wobbled in the sky that hissed and spit and fell. They groaned and coughed into their hands, then turned the radios on to static. They stayed all night and watched it shed itself and shrink, nickel, flame, then pinprick. Then they went to sleep. Here in the provinces, news comes slowly. We are a simple people and live as if concealed. The next morning we shoveled ash away and went about our business. A roof or two had caved. I waited for your letter from the city, but it never came. Here's another rhyming poem. Um, I'm going to read it because... Uh, because it's called There Is No Audience for Poetry. That's fun to read it at a re poetry reading. It's part of a series of poems I wrote about bodies in the trunks of cars. Um, there is no audience for poetry. They wanted him to stop kicking like that. It made their eyes corkscrew, it drilled the sun in the sky so light dumped out like blood from a leak. The boy in the trunk wouldn't die. They drove and drove, and he dented the trunk's tight lid, called their names, then pounded the wheel wells with a tire iron. The sun filled their skulls so they felt like hell, and the boy in the trunk wouldn't listen. You'd think it was burning hot in there. You'd think he'd be gone, passive, but no, the boy in the trunk banged on and on until the noise grew God Almighty unforgivable, and they had no choice but to pull into the woods, leave the car, try to hitch a ride with someone quieter, someone who could listen without interrupting. They'd had a hot day. The road simmered to the overheated sky, but from far away they still heard him, the boy in the trunk, 
his empty cry. I'm gonna read a few who are, that are really new. Um, this is one of the rare poems I ever read that is actually based on something that, that happened, which happened in Ohio, in Kent, Ohio, um, when I was out in a wheat field with my brother lighting off fireworks, and we lit the whole field on fire. Um, you know, it's funny how it burns when you do that. that it starts as a little circle, and then the circle widens. I don't know if anybody else has ever accidentally lit a wheat field on fire. But um, we were terrified. <laughs> I never told anybody until now. <laughs> um, but this is a poem that leaps around a little bit, and I'm going to signal that by pausing. It, 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 it moves from a, somebody thinking about literature and his father to this story um, about the, the two um, the boys lighting the field on fire, and then it, it goes into the underworld briefly. Um, it's called Fireworks. He believed that great literature was elastic, and by this he meant that it shaped itself to the concerns of each new generation of readers. Homer, he was fond of saying, is elastic. We cannot read him as Greeks, so we read him as ourselves and find in him exactly what we are looking for. Shakespeare, elastic, Milton, etc. You're going to do it you said, and I said, of course I'm going to do it. And I struck the match, and for a moment your face glowed yellow in its light, and then I lit the fuse. His mother had died, and later his father had died painfully, so now he had no one, or so he thought, and it was a comfort that books might speak to him in ways that were intimate and new, that this was part of their fundamental design, the dead speaking to the living and up to the heavens with the rocket while you caught your breath, and the black sky ripped with color, one rocket after another, and oh, you said, as I lit each fuse, hard to believe the whole field would catch, though it was the dry season late July, and the tall grasses took the flame easily, and mostly I remember running from there. God or his parents whispering to him through the pages of books. They spoke to him on rainless days, his father cleaning his boots, the smell of black polish, the sound of the brush, his mother turning the page. Don't move, I said, as we watched the field burn from behind the trees, waves of black smoke that obliterated the barns behind them, the circle of flame widening. Thus the field opened like an eye. And the young man looked up from his book. He had read it before. Achilles in the land of the dead, mists rising off the water, the smoking dead. What did it mean? His mind had drifted, his father brushing his boots, until, darling, his mother said, must you do that at the table? And yes, his father said, holding up the polished boot, I must. It meant the following. The wind was strong, the fire devoured the field, then it jumped to the brush by the barn, then to the barn itself, which caught quickly. A single horse cowered among the hay bales, its oily fur glowing bluely as the flame approached it. Calm down, you said. No one will know a thing. We have to get out of here is all. And then we were running toward the car. By God, I'd rather slave on earth for another man, some dirt-poor tenant farmer who scrapes to keep alive than rule down here over all the breathless dead, said Achilles from the burning fields. His father caught beneath the tractor's tire, gasped once more, then relaxed in the field. And now the young man was alone looking over the field that in another part of this poem I burned with my friend. And who could account for such desolation? Reading a book by the window, parentless and alone, dry fields perturbed by wind and sunlight. And then the horse burst through the barn doors and galloped into the field next door, its flaming body glowing orange and blue in the night. And it set that field afire too, before it stumbled once, twice, and fell smoking onto its side. And so, the young man thought, laying down his book, while his father put his boots away, and his mother sighed, 
And so, literature is handed on from one generation to the next. This is the newest one I'm gonna read. I haven't actually read it out loud uh, to an audience before, um, but it's primary season. And I just voted in Texas, which is almost futile. And, um, <laughs> and um, in the gymnasium down the street. So I wrote this poem about that. It's called, I Have Voted. The dogs tipped the garbage and the meat spilled out. The larger dog licked it, the smaller stood to the side and growled. The meat quivered on the floor, raw because I'd kept it too long, expired and wet and pink. All this while I stood in line, and then the ballot machine glowed greenly. Yes, 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 I told its eyes, while the large dog sniffed the meat, lifted it gingerly with its mouth, dropped it wetly to the floor. And America, I said, walking home from the high school gymnasium, I love you. I am your son. I have voted. While the two dogs circled the mess, growling, oh, my beautiful country, a bolt gun reduces the animal instantly to unconsciousness. No pain, says the guidebook called Bolt Stunning Techniques for Cattle. Draw an X from the tops of the eyes to the tips of the horns. The bolt goes in there, there, gently, right into the skull. And then we have meat for the family, for the country, for the dogs to circle. I am always proud to cast my ballot, my information, into the nation's stunned skull. The meat had a suspicious smell. The little dog wouldn't stop yipping, but the larger dog had the fat pink thing in its jaws. I'm gonna read this one because it appeared in your excellent new Ohio Review and um, um, that was really great of you to publish it. And um, I was living in Middletown, Connecticut um, about 25 years ago and, or maybe 30, no, 25. And, um, <laughs> and there was this, I, was I wanted to be a novelist and I was working in this used bookstore and they paid us only in books there because um, there was just <laughs> no money. And, um, <laughs> and one day this guy came in named Chandler Brossard and the owner of the bookstore introduced him to me. He was an old guy, like, at least, I don't know, how, I, he seemed old. Um, and the, the owner of the bookstore said to me, this is Chandler Brossard, he used to be a famous author once. And I think she said that out of kindness because she knew I was trying, I wanted to write a novel. And, um, and I was a real jerk to Chandler Brossard. I got vaguely competitive, you know, like I felt really competitive. And he was an old guy and I thought, you know, I'm too cool for him. So I, I'm sorry I treated him meanly. And, um, and, I, and I learned later that he was in town volunteering basically at this bookstore because he was getting cancer treatments in, in, this, in Middletown, and, which he subsequently died of. And I gave him no more thought. I, I, it's hard to say until um, 30, years later, 25 years later, however many years later. And um, I was reading an issue of Harper's in which somebody was talking about the great, the great unknown authors of the 20th century. And there was Chandler Brossard's name. And I just thought, wow, what a dumb thing to have missed out on Chandler Brossard. So um, this poem is called Chandler Brossard. When I was 20 and desperate and broke, I worked part-time in a used bookstore in Middletown, Connecticut. I hated my job, hated the cramped store, hated the paperbacks that came there as if to die. And more than anything, I wanted to write something lasting, a novel I scrawled in notebooks called Black Wing, about a dark-haired girl prized during the day for her beauty and intellect, who by night killed off posers, the ill-read, the clumsy of mind, the bombastic, thick-fingered and mean. Somehow, through incompetence or charity, the young woman who owned the store never quite fired me. Though one morning I found an old man at my place at the cash register. He wore a tight leather jacket, a turtleneck, 
a gray mustache, and when he saw me, he took off his glasses and set his book down on the dust-speckled counter. This is Chandler Brossard, the owner told me. You'll work with him now. He looked pale and sick. It was meant to transcend mystery. It was meant to, be, to live in contradictions, to be existential and enigmatic, the dark-haired girl destroying what was not beautiful and the ugly one-legged detective who pursued her but could never apprehend her. Chandler Brossard, thin-faced and coughing. Chandler Brossard, tilted back in his chair, reading a book in the sunlit dust motes. What are you writing, he asked me one day, and I closed my notebook. Nothing, I said, looking at what age had done to his hands. He was, the owner told me, a famous writer once, but now he was dying. Chandler Brossard's We Walk in Darkness grew yellow on the shelf, and he smelled like an old man, sweet and thick, Vicks Vaporub and snuff and mint. How the knife comes down, I thought, typing away that night while one of my roommates burned his fingers on a joint and the other practiced his guitar. How the knife comes down in the flesh of the critic, in the sycophant, the vulgar, and the room grew colder because no one paid our bills. And I wanted Chandler Brossard to say something wise, but he was just an old man. And when I finally told him about Black Wing, the plot seemed suddenly contrived, ugly truth pursuing beauty, beauty making our foibles clear, the dark dark-haired girl who posed the horrible bodies for the one-legged detective to discover. By then, I'd read one of Brossard's novels and found it full of squalor, familiar, and he'd grown sicker, pale and unsteady, though he'd still walked from the hospital each morning and sat behind the counter selling paperbacks. My boss didn't know I'd been kicked out of my apartment, that when I couldn't find a friend to put me up, I unrolled a sleeping bag in the bookstore. And what I remember most about those days is lying on the floor among stacks of dying books, the sense of them rising above me in darkness, so many minds at work, so much trapped thought, while at his apartment, Chandler Brossard had a few months to live, and I slipped into sleep, dreaming of dark-haired angels, angels of squalor, angels of anger and forgetfulness and sudden mercy in the black air above my head, angels descending to smother me with beauty and ambition and paper wings, and even if the detective caught her, what then? Would he know something more about immortal beauty? He would still be nothing, a dying, childless old man who had preserved a bit of himself in a book. Immortality figured as the workings of a mind caught in the sunlit trap of prose. How I wanted that to be true. That sense of eternal light streaming through store windows, its fingers playing over my face, warm and gentle, the scent of books and dust, how lovely to lie there without meaning or ambition, how deathless, and Chandler Brossard standing over me, kicking me gently awake with his boot. Here's one called In the Wheat Field. It's also really new. It's your rabbit, the officer told the soldier, who pointed his rifle at the fleeing enemy child. The child was quick in the wheat, so it took three shots before he tumbled into the afterlife. Many years later, I put down my book about the war and walked under the oak's black branches to where the snow had capped all the cars in the elementary school parking lot. The rooftops glittered meanly. I have never killed anything, and look at me. I am like the boss of hell. In the silent movie, the moon took a rocket to the face and never stopped smiling. Tonight, its ashes scatter over the rooftops. No, that snow. Of all the people he murdered, that soldier could not forget how the child swayed a moment in the wheat before disappearing under the sea of it. I once found a bullet casing right here on this sidewalk, and not far from it, a stain. How could I not imagine the rest of that story? The cars grow cool and dire in the parking lot, and the sodium lights hum like enormous insects. The soldier wrote a whole book about what he had done, 
but it didn't help. Come on and snow all over me. Come on and shower me with ash. The sky is a bone. The moon is a hole in somebody's skull. I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to include with two sort of medium length poems. Um, well, maybe they're sort of longer poems, but um, there's two of them. Um, one of them, uh, I, I was reading about the disturbing frequency um, with which doctors leave objects inside the bodies of patients, <laughs> um, surgeons that is, and then they sew them in, up in there, right? So th this, is, this is a poem that's also a little bit shifty. So. Um, I'm going to tell you the shifts ahead of time um, because you don't, the, the, all these poems have little plus signs between the stanzas because I had this idea that it was like this plus this plus this plus this. And, um, but this one shifts a little bit between the doctor, um, the patient who lies on the table looking up at the doctor, and an inexplicable English professor who's in the, who's in the operating room commenting on the action. <laughs> I'm just gonna put that there. It's called Inside the Body. He left a clamp inside the body and only that night lying in bed did he realize what he'd done. This is why he couldn't sleep. This is why the next morning he was so tired he left a safety pin inside another body. This is why he forgot the sponge in the rib cage, the scope in the abdomen. This is why he forgot the tweezers and the acepto bulbs, the surgical retractor and the needle. He had such worries he couldn't rest and all day long he bent over sleeping bodies holding scalpels that inevitably he'd leave inside them before he sewed them up. When I woke, it was to a bright light and God was bending over me. He's coming too, God said, and his face grew large and blotted out the glare. Dear God, I was thinking, I cannot feel my legs. Dear God, I am like a mind floating over a table on which my body is sleeping. The university professor was saying that the body exists to demarcate the liminal space between the living and the dead. The body, she was saying, is a contested zone between presence and absence, between consciousness and eternal sleep, between the earth and the afterlife, between ourselves and the terrifying ambiguity of the void. <laughs> the students wrote all of this down. <laughs> the body, she said, is a foreign object, neither the person we know nor the empty husk that person leaves behind. It is a symbol unmoored from the limitations of meaning. My body, was full of foreign objects, bone saw, syringe, several yards of gauze. I could see them glittering as I rose above the surgical lamps. And at night, the surgeon dreamed of the objects he'd lost inside his patients, lined up on long window sills, glittering in the playful sunshine, steel retractors, suction tips, drills, and calipers. In his dreams, his surgical mask fell off his face into the body, his glasses too. In his dreams, he rolled up a white paper hospital gown, stuffed it into the incision, and sewed the patient up. His wife was leaving him. He'd had too much to drink. Are you all right? The nurses asked, shaking their heads. Are you sure? We bury the body or we leave it on a ledge to the darkness. We tie rocks around its legs and sink it in the sea. We put it in a bag and throw it from a cliff. We remove the indifferent entrails. We remove the brain piece by piece through the nose. We sew the eyelids shut. We sprinkle it with ochre. We stuff it with fruit. We stuff it with gold. We sew inside it wine and aromatic spices, a beloved family pet. So do we make of the emptiness of the body a vessel for the meanings we impose upon it, the professor told her students who wrote all of this down. <laughs> what would it mean to spend my last moments knowing that inside me the surgeon's wedding ring had clotted over, grown thick and blood encapsulated? His wife, anyway, had left him. His children disliked him. He'd been up all night drinking and left the shot glass in the body of a patient. And when I opened my eyes, his face floated between mine and the surgical lamp like God's holy visage. 
And so I hovered high above the heads of the nurses, above the breathing machine and its many cords over the poles and their dangling bags of fluid. Death must be distinguished from dying, from which it is often confounded, the professor said, holding up a book, while into my body the surgeon poured his drinks and tears. Into my body he stuffed his money. Into my body he lost his children and his wife. Into my body his distant youth vanished. When it goes, it takes our fears with it and creates new ones, the professor told her students, gesturing to the surgeon who was washing his hands and crying. And after a while, the professor closed her book and went home to her life. The surgeon, too, returned to his quiet house and his fears. My body, empty of me, lay on the table like an overstuffed bag. And I'm just going to end with um, this poem, which is the title poem in the book, um, which means it's called Churches. Um, it's got this very spooky little girl in it. Churches. In 1981, in a hotel gift shop outside Phoenix, Arizona, a little girl stood by the postcard rack, turning it gently. It creaked. She considered a picture of the desert, then looked around for her mother, who was elsewhere. She gave the rack a firm push, so it spun gently on its axle, smiled, pushed it again, and the postcard rack wobbled on spindly legs. And soon she had it spinning so quickly the cards made long, blurry streaks in the rotation. Gasps of blue for sky, red for dirt, and then faster, the girl slapping at it with her hands, grinning at me. And then a single postcard rose from the rack, spun in the air, and landed at my feet, a picture of a yawning canyon. And then another, handfuls of postcards rising from the rack, turning in the air while the girl laughed and her oblivious mother at the other end of the store bought a map or a box of fudge. And then the air was full of pictures, all of them shouting, Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix twirling and falling until the empty postcard rack groaned once more tipped and crashed through the window. There ought to be a word that suggests how we're balanced at the very tip of history and behind us, everything speeds irretrievably away. It's called impermanence, the little girl said, looking at the mess of postcards on the floor. It's called transience, she said, gently touching the broken window. It's called dying, she said. It was 1981, and the clerk ran from behind the counter, stood before us. The girl smiled sweetly. The postcard rack glittered in the sun and broken glass. He turned to me, and my face grew hot. I couldn't help it. I was blushing. In 2009, my father lay in a hospital bed, gesturing sweepingly with his hands. What are you doing? I asked him. I'm building a church, he said. You're making a church, I said. Can't you see, he said. He seemed to be patting something in the air, sculpting something, a roof that floated above him. The hospital room was quiet and white. What kind of a church is it? I'm not finished. Is it a church you remember? God damn it, he said. Can't you see I'm busy? It was 1988, and I stood in line for my diploma, and my father took a picture that I've lost now. 1984, and there we are, around a campfire I can't remember. It was 2002, and his cells began to divide wrongly. First one deep in the wrist bone, then another turned hot and strange, deformed, humpbacked and fissured, queer and off-kilter, one after the other, though no one would know it for years. It's called dying, the little girl said, while the postcards suspended in the air like a thousand days. I reached out to touch one, then another, and all at once they fell to the floor. Then the clerk said I was paying for the window. Where were my parents and who was going to pay if I didn't know where my parents were? And the girl smiled from behind the keychains, and her mother pursed her lips at the far end of the store. The window had a hole in it through which a dry breeze came. The postcards shifted on the floor. 
Years later, my father was still making that church with his hands. They do that, the nurse said, patting his head like he was a little boy. He was concentrating on the church, though, his hands shaping first what seemed to be the apse, then fluttering gently down the transepts. He sighed, heavily, frustrated, began again. Can I bring you anything else? The nurse asked. No, I said, thanks. Are you sure? She watched him tile the roof, watched his fingers shape another arch, and then it was much later and he'd fallen asleep. Outside, snow covered up the cars. It's called forgetting, the girl said, while the clerk watched me and I blushed, until there's nothing left. And a breeze entered through the hole in the window, and then you're out of time, she said, and shrugged. Some of the cards were face up on the floor, two burrows climbing a craggy slope, the Grand Canyon like a mouth carved in the earth, a night-lit tower like a needle. I was sweating now, but I couldn't speak, and then I was running from the shop, past the fountain and the check-in desk, down the tiled hall to the hotel pool where my father lay on a plastic beach chair reading a book about churches. Sunlight flecked his chest. His hair was wet from swimming. What's the trouble, he asked. First, his cells were thick and soupy, clotted and aghast, and then they were spinning through the air, and it was 1986, and rain drummed on the roof, or it was snowing years later in Cleveland, his hands working the air while the nurse stood in the doorway inside. Wind and sun, a bright day, a lovely day to lie by the hotel pool and read about how men spent lifetimes building them and never saw them finished. Thank you. Thank you.